Hi, my name is Christina Hardy, and I am giving a presentation today on the sixth house and issues in self-improvement that allows the soul to grow. Now, this is based upon Jeffrey Green's article, uh, which I have the uh, I have uh, written out. I actually have a link here uh, that will take you to the article, but also evolutionary astrology uh, Zoom meetings also posted on it onto their website. The link as well, and I highly recommend um, reading the article. Uh, number one, because it's from uh, Jeffrey Green's mouth himself. Uh, and it's very substantial, much more substantial than I am able to deliver in this presentation. So you'll get a lot more material out of it than what you'd be able to get here. Uh, so uh, that would, yeah, that would mostly be it. Uh, also, I had actually planned on giving this presentation back in May, uh, but here we are now three months later. And, but it turns out very appropriately in Virgo territory, now that we have the sun in Virgo, as well as Mars and Mercury in Virgo. So it's a very Virgo time. So I can imagine we are all just really resonating with this Virgo energy. So um, I'm going to move along here. Yeah. Uh, just a real quick, very brief description of a bit of my background that is relevant to uh, the evolutionary astrology. It's uh, there, of course, there is a lot more as it is with everybody, but I just want to kind of give you a little bit of grounding in me. Some of you may know this uh, very well, but for those of you who don't, I do have my master's in transpersonal psychology from John F. Kennedy University's out in the uh, Bay Area of California. Uh, and then I actually moved on uh, actually to work on my doctorate, which I never completed, but I worked with Richard Tarr at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco. And that, as you can imagine, if anyone knows Richard Tarnas and his work, that was an absolute delight. And I learned a tremendous amount while I was there. I was in a program, a doctoral program called philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness. So it was a very juicy program. I learned a tremendous amount. And astrology, archetypal astrology was very much integrated into the program. Uh, so that's where I was, although I had been studying astrology prior to that, um, this was when I really sort of launched into a very focused understanding of astrology. And he was teaching classes called uh, Psyche and Cosmos. Uh, this is prior to his book, Cosmos and Psyche, uh, where he speaks to the archetypal nature of the evolution of consciousness as we see in history and as we see in uh, very um, important, significant figures, whether they're writers or politicians or poets or musicians uh, throughout time and how uh, the people and the expression of the times were actually expressing, were manifesting uh, the archetypal nature of the cosmos uh, concretely in the world at that time. So it's a fascinating book. I highly recommend uh, reading it, Cosmos and Psyche. Uh, he's written other books as well. Uh, and so this is where I got a real grounding in archetypal astrology. And I continued on and eventually I, um, was very interested in finding out more about, I uh, didn't really have the concept of evolutionary astrology. I didn't know what it was at the time, um, but I wanted to understand the South Node and the North Node of the moon. And I, I had this, I had this uh, flash in my head that said, you know, I would really like to read people's actual past life stories that have been correlated to the south node of the moon and as well as the north node of the moon have been correlated to their charts. And so I thought, I bet somebody's written a book about that or let me see if there's a book that has been written about it. So I Googled and sure enough, Patricia Walsh had just um, uh, published Sorry, Chris, Christina, I accidentally mute, muted you. Whoops. Are Sorry. we starting from the beginning? <laughs> yes. So when did I get muted? Uh, when, you, when you started talking about um, wanting to know about people's evolutionary sto uh, sto past life okay. stories. 
so okay at the very okay just recently okay yes yes so i'll just continue yeah you didn't miss much so um patricia walsh had recently uh written a book about that correlating uh, god knows how many thousands if not tens of thousands um uh, a actual past life experiences with their charts. And uh, she's read that book, Understanding Karmic Complexes is just wonderful. And so I decided to launch into her certification training program uh, as a deep memory pro process um, regression uh, counselor and completed that a number of years later. And but in the process, and this is where I got introduced to evolutionary astrology, I happened to land in a group in Portland, Oregon, uh, and worked with them for three years. And there were many evolutionary astrologers in that program, including uh, Kim Marie Weimer. She was one of um, Patricia Walsh's sort of sidekicks, if you will, helping out Patricia Walsh. So I got introduced to Kim Marie Weimer. And after I got my certification in evolution in deep memory process, then I decided to start the certification program through Kim Marie Weimer's program, evolutionaryastrology.net. And about five years later, I think I was certified. So um, that is a bit of my background. Now, I didn't study directly under Jeffrey Green, uh, Kim Marie Weimer, Patricia, Patricia Walsh did. I guess I'm considered a second generation um, evolutionary astrologer. And, um, but I've read all those books, of course, and uh, it's just amazing. I'm always, every time I launch into reading a piece, I learn so much more. So, and then I also have Dane Rugier here, who I've, you know, I've, I just, he's, he's been a very significant influence in my work. Of course, I haven't studied under him. Uh, he's passed a long time ago, but uh, his writing has really influenced my work as well. So these are basically my teachers. This is what I'm grounded in. And I'm going to, before I actually launch into the presentation itself, I do want to say for those who are present, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for being here. And I'm going to wait to take questions until the very end, uh, if you don't mind. It's, I think it'll keep to the flow. It'll keep us focused. And oftentimes, sometimes the, the questions will get answered later anyway. Uh, we have two lovely volunteers. I've been studying their charts uh, intimately for the last God knows, four or five days. And so I'm thrilled that they are here and I am very uh, excited to introduce them to you uh, when we get to that part of it, of, of the presentation. And, and I will be speaking to each one of their charts uh, in relationship to the sixth house and issues in self-improvement that, that allows the soul to grow, okay? So, but before we get there and... I will be speaking to the archetypes uh, that we're talking about here and uh, giving sort of an introductory um, foundation. And then we'll be relating this material to the actual persons and their charts. So starting with uh, Mercury, in, uh, which rules Virgo, which rules the sixth house. These two archetypes in evolutionary astrology are equiv fairly equivalent. Uh, here's a symbol for Mercury, and there's a symbol for Virgo, okay? So Virgo is an air element combined with the earth element, okay? So it's a, the integration of the mental and the physical bodies. It is a yin polarity, and so that bring, gives it uh, the Virgo sixth house. It gives that introverted uh, nature uh, to this archetype. It, we bring the attention inward, and I'll, it, it, I'll go into a lot of detail as to why, uh, but what the inward processing are, is uh, related to that. It is a mutable modality, so it, it shifts, it changes, it's mutable, uh, and it's, it's about learning, it's about growth, continual learning, continual growth uh, through shifting and changing and adjusting and adapting. Now, Mercury, the archetype of Mercury uh, get in, in uh, Virgo. Now, I do want to say up front, we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but Mercury as the ruler of Virgo, there are two, there's the yin expression of Mercury and there's the yang expression of your, uh, Mercury. Here in Virgo, it is the yin. It is the inward movement of the mind through the physical body or through physical reality itself, not just the body, but all physical reality. So when you put uh, Mercury in Virgo, it gives one an excellent eye for detail. Um, it tends to be very focused, uh, discernment, 
discrimination. Uh, sort of one of the archetypes for it is the analyst. Mercury in Virgo desires to function efficiently. It also is to serve, okay? As it desires to serve, it rules one's daily work and duties, okay? And the, and the, the thing with uh, Virgo, the nature of Virgo in the sixth house around daily work is that it's the consistency of every single day. Uh, bringing the eye, bringing the mind through into physical reality in a habitual way, you know, day after day after day. It's the little adjusting that one does from day to day to day. And, and that includes, it rules daily health and wellness. So the rituals, the practice is very significant uh, for any planets in the sixth house uh, or any planets in Virgo, the, the learning, the adjusting, the growth occurs bit by bit on a daily level, okay? That's how it works. Sort of like building blocks, if you will. But the practice of the ritual uh, is, it seems to be very significant in actually in making actual improvement, okay? And, and uh, Mercury in Virgo is very much concerned with practical concrete improvement, okay? It's very different than the uh, Sagittarian, um, much more, which is, uh, uh, not necessarily the opposite, but much more conceptual uh, and much more interested in the meaning and the purpose um, of, of that aspect of the mind. So Mercury in Virgo is kind of like the, the mouse that you know pays attention to the details. And uh, so on the practical level, it is learning skills that are practical uh, and for the sake of becoming more efficient. Uh, if you have a lot of planets in the sixth house, uh, building skills is important. And I'll explain why later why that is so important. Um, in its, now, Mercury through the physical body is very much wired to see to improve things, okay? So along with that comes seeing what's wrong with things, okay? And that can create an inner critic, critic because it seems to see what's wrong with things. It can see what's wrong with things more than what it sees what's right with things. Okay? It's kind of designed to see what's wrong with things in order to fix them, okay? And with that, with that ability to see what's wrong, which is an incredible skill to have, um, it can also, if the mind gets caught there and doesn't have a wider, larger um, purpose or anything that inspires them to a more holistic picture, if they get caught into the details, then it can bring uh, the distortions of self-doubt. And this is a typical distort distortion of six house planets and planets in Virgo is where one doubts oneself, okay? But the, the purpose of the doubting is not to undermine you. It, the purpose of it is to fix it, to make it better, okay? To change, to adapt. Um, another distortion would be feeling guilty. Like there's something wrong with me when you get caught up with, um, with what is wrong. And, and the, the, the mercury as the mind goes through the physical body and through the nervous system, it can get caught, very much caught up in mental loops and not be able to find a way out of the mental loop. Now, as I'm talking about um, Jeffrey Green's article, uh, he gives a wonderful strategy of how to get out of the mental loops and how to get out of, um, um, how to actually transmute the distortions. And that's what I'll be talking about here. So right now I'm just setting up the archetype. And so some more of the distortions here would be not satisfied with reality as it is in, in continuously seeing all of its imperfections. So there's a sense of uh, impatience with the imperfection of reality. Um, and, and that also can bring, especially with the mental looping, uh, a lot of anxiety, okay? Especially if, they're, if they don't know what's wrong and they don't know how to fix it. Uh, they just feel, emotionally feel that there's something wrong. Uh, so um, that brings the anxiety along with it. And only, you know, one of the distortions only sees what's wrong to the point of undermining themselves as well as projecting it out onto others. Uh, Virgo uh, can be very defensive when criticized by others. And part of that is, is because there is so much self-criticism going on that when it comes to, when they find it outside of themselves, which often they will because it gets projected that way, uh, then they 
they automatically get defensive. It's like they've had enough of it. Um, and the martyr, which I'll be talking about soon. Moving to the next slide. Okay, so rather that, that the previous slide had a lot of information, this slide we're just really focusing. Uh, we're gonna the next slides we're gonna really focus on one piece at a time, uh, easier to to comprehend I think, or, or breaking down kind of what I said um, into segments. So uh, mercury in uh, so mercury as it runs through the physical body, it is in Virgo sixth house really represents. Uh, our body and, and, and the sort of the, the highest functioning of it is it, the, the feeling, the experience of our physical body as a sacred vessel. As I mentioned before, it is uh, the mercury, it's the yin aspect of mercury. And you can actually see it in the symbol here with the M uh, and then the, this line moving inward. So it's a, con a continual process of uh, inner self-analysis um, with the attempt of arriving to a place where they, their whole psyche, their whole system, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically, they are able to better hold the light of consciousness. Okay. As our consciousness evolves, this vessel is constantly adapting and changing. So there's no ultimate goal of perfection, of arriving at perfection. That is the mutability of this sign is the continual changing, the continual growth, the continual adjusting. Again, the physical, emotional, mental, and sp spiritual, it is a continual process of self-improvement. Uh, Virgo, planets in the sixth house, uh, is going through a process of detoxification, a process of cleansing a process of assimilation and integration. All of these are important, not just the detoxing. It's also the assimilation and the integration for evolution to occur. Now, Virgo is in opposition to the 12th house and that the uh, archetype of the 12th house, it's ruled by Neptune, the planet of Neptune and the sign of Pisces. So it's always in, in dialogue, let's say, between the sixth house, the 12th house, or Virgo and Pisces. And this dialogue is uh, the dialogue of Pisces or Neptune really influences the Virgo archetype in the sense that, excuse me, in the sense that it's continuously trying to achieve the, the Neptunian, the Piscean perfection. So I like to think of it as, as it's almost like, you know, somebody you know, thinking of the physical body, somebody has a really good ear for sound and they, they, they have a perfect pitch or their, their, their ear can hear the perfect pit, pitch. I am not one of those people, but I know there are a lot who can. And they, they hear in life, you know, their physical reality around them, they're constantly hearing the perfect pitch or seeing the perfect pitch or imagining the perfect pitch. And yet physical reality as they see it, as they experience it is far from achieving that perfection. And that's part of the issue of this um, th that can bring about uh, self-doubt and the undermining of themselves or the sort of self-criticism or the sort of feeling of I'm not good enough and, and so on. Um, but that is also with Virgo, that is, all, that is what needs to be toxi detoxified is the um, distortions of Virgo. And those distortions being, I am not good enough. And I have some more coming here, but I want to show you with this slide, as you see here, the, the sort of the Piscean counterpart uh, that one, uh, the Virgo archetype is, is constantly striving to achieve. So the process, the purification process to higher and higher octaves over time and the process of synthesis to achieve more holistic understandings of our own truth. So the Virgo archetype, the distortions, when we get caught up in our negativity, um, we can feel victimized, we can feel conspired against, we can feel persecuted. The question is why do we feel that way? 
There are, Jeffrey Green uh, lays out, he particularly talks about one of them. And now I can't remember if I added a couple. Yeah, no, he, okay, he talks about them. So there are three different ways of that, um, that could be the cause for, for the introvertedness, the yin aspect going inward and feeling victimized, you know, adopting that attitude that one is victimized. Uh, first of all, one would be somehow thinking that, that everything that happens to us or some things that happen to us are happening to us in an unjust way. Uh, and we don't receive the message of the perfection of Mercury's timing. So Jeffrey Green spoke about this. So Mercury rules timing um, and uh, along with Saturn, it rules time. But with as Mercury moves around the chart, it can trigger events, it can trigger things, okay? And this is transiting Mercury as it's moving around the chart. It correlates to the Mercury that rules this, that naturally or in general astrology rules the sixth house. So as Mercury is transiting around the, the chart, it can trigger uh, things to happen. It can trigger, and this is a very Virgo thing, is, is crises, which I'll explain in a minute, but it can sort of turn everything upside down. And one attitude that we one can adopt is, why are they doing this to me? Why is this always happening to me? And it happens to me over and over and over. And then compare yourself to other people. And that's the, the Piscean sort of illusion, constantly comparing yourself to other people, uh, thinking that everything's perfect for other people, but I'm the one that keeps uh, having things happen to me, like the, the poor me martyr. Okay. And so this is where they're, they're not synchronized or they're not attuned to or that they, they don't believe in that life is that they are basically creating their own life uh, and magnetizing to them that's the yin aspect of virgo magnetization magnetizing to oneself that which one is projecting outward okay now another uh, potential reason for feeling you know you know constantly victimized for instance if one has a lot of stuff going on in the 11th house and feeling you know just you know even emotionally feeling persecuted you know when when you're in a group of people and you don't even know why you're feeling that way it, it's always possible that one actually was persecuted in a previous life and you're bringing that memory on your sleeve into this lifetime for the purpose of healing it and for the purpose of uh, detoxifying it, okay? But the only way to do so is to become aware of it. Uh, and so that's, it's coming to your consciousness that uh, in the, this situation over and over and over again, I'm feeling persecuted. And the question is why, and it's the Virgo uh, going inward to figure it out. And then the third one, which Jeffrey Green speaks a lot to is uh, where he teaches the difference between natural guilt and conditioned guilt, uh, where he says, natural guilt is the inner voice that says, quote, I am in a state of crisis and I need to do something about it. But then when we don't do something about it, we can feel guilty because we know at, a, at the level of the soul that for us to evolve, that we are being asked to do something about this crisis, okay? So we all need wake up calls uh, and that is what crises can do or oftentimes does for us. It, it just brings things to our awareness that something needs to be changed uh, when it gets to the point where we haven't been listening long enough. Um, so if we're going to change, um, then it's the energy moves, the energy transition, it transmutes itself. Um, so, and again, I'm just reading my note here so that we unconsciously create a crisis such that when we reach the critical point, it forces us to analyze what cre created the crises in the first place, okay? And as Jeffrey Green says, quote, crises serves, in other words, sixth house serves as a vehicle through which self-knowledge, parenthesis, mercury ruled, takes place because it puts the light of day onto what the dynamics are through the Virgo analysis, okay? Now, conditioned guilt is the mental scripting that we have adopted from the conditions of society, okay? Very different from natural guilt. One of the strongest influences, as you can imagine, is the belief that we are born in sin, all right? And that is something that has sort of, um, uh, I don't know, 
put itself into stone over thousands of years of history through the variety of religious traditions who have just uh, reinforced that belief over and over and over again. Uh, so it's been concretized in the, basically in the patriarchal religions across the world for thousands of years. And so we come into carrying that belief that we bought into in, from a previous life. So there, there can be, and very likely this sort of emotional internal sense of guilt and we don't know why, um, or this internal sense of there's something wrong with me or um, I did something bad or just waiting for you know, being caught. Uh, and it could just really be a previous life memory of really trying to come into conscious awareness, okay? And so part of the, <clears throat> um, you know, the antidote is the 12th house uh, Neptune uh, Pisces antidote to that, uh, where one forgives, one goes through a whole process of uh, forgiveness, uh, but I'll be talking more about that in a minute. So any of these can create self-doubt. Uh, I'm sure there are others uh, which can undermine us such that when we then create excuses to justify why we hadn't tried to actualize our best in a particular uh, situation. When we avoid the challenge given to us, okay, oftentimes through Mercury as it transits around our charts, uh, to strengthen our skills or to self-improve, we do create a crisis. The key to the sixth house planets and the planet that rules the sixth house is the continuous rhythm of action and contemplation. Once the period of contemplation has been fulfilled and awareness of the problem gained, then we move into the outer flow of the rhythm and act on our instincts. So I, I think my next slide shows this here. Yeah, so it's a, it's, it is, Virgo is an inward journey. And yet as we become aware, action needs to be taken. So the rhythm of yin and yang in this mutable, mutable house is the continuous rhythm of contemplation and action. Once the period of contemplation has been fulfilled and the awareness of the problem gained, then we move into the outer flow of the rhythm and act on our instincts. Too much of either creates imbalance. So Virgo, virg the Virgin, it represents the Virgin, that is its meaning, but obviously, and I know many of you know this, it, it doesn't mean somebody who has not had sex, has not had the enjoyment of sex. Those of us in evolutionary astrology really believe in the, the power of our desires for trans, you know, to transmute us you know, towards our evolutionary potential. It is though what it does mean by the Virgin is she or he who is self-contained who is not dependent upon others for their own sense of self-sufficiency or a sense of, of who they are, okay? And ultimately this is uh, the integration of spirit, mind, emotions, and body. So um, now what I'm gonna launch into is, uh, Jeffrey Green talks about this in the article. And uh, the six, the, to really understand, I've already referred to it quite a bit as I've been going through here, but it's, I, for those of us who are visually oriented, it's nice to see it visually. And that is to see the, the sixth house, 12th house polarity. Um, so our 360 degree chart, our wheel here uh, is, you know, can be divided uh, between the lower half and the upper half, all right? And the lower half represents basically the development of the self, okay? We have the first house, which is the development of me uh, through taking risk, having the courage to try new things, to find out who the me is. Second house, finding out what our values are and getting grounded in the physical world, uh, learning to build a foundation uh, in physical reality, second house um, being ruled by Taurus. Um, that is based upon our values. And third house is how we mentally, you know, become aware of the environment that we are in. Uh, 
and the world around us through the accumulation of facts and evidence through our five senses. Okay, and then the fourth house uh, represents the emotional body, our, our feelings and our home, our family, uh, feeling emotionally secure. Now the fifth house is where one has, you know, ruled by the sun and Leo, which is radiates the solar fire in the world and is just, um, you know, is, is just the beauty, the joy of expressing oneself, whether, whatever, however that is, it could be expression through, you know, uh, introverted kind of means, whether it's writing, it all depends on a person's chart, but also expressing uh, in the world, the joy of expressing the truth of who one is, you know, fifth house and, and creatively expressing oneself and seeing oneself in, in your, um, creative expressions. So that would be the fifth house. Now, then you come to the sixth house and that house is where you're, it's like you're coming off the pedestal of fifth house. You know, I always get this in, image of Humpty Dumpty on the, you know, on the, what is he on? He's on a, geez, what is he on? He's on a fence. Anyway, this huge sort of inflated ego, you know, if you continuously express, express, express without any awareness that there are billions of other people who need to be acknowledged and expressed as well, um, one can be overly narcissistic, overly uh, self-centered and so on and really uh, build that egocentric um, sense of self in the world that, that everything revolves around the self. So the sixth house purpose is to Humpty Dumpty coming off that wall, or as Jeffrey Green likes to say, the inversion of the pyramid. So the fifth house is when one has arrived at the top of the pyramid, sixth house, when we move to developmentally move to the sixth, sixth house, one, the pyramid is inverted. And so this is the house of humility. It's the house of sacrificing the ego as we prepare for the upper half of the chart. And the upper half of the chart being preparing us, ourselves to enter into the world and preparing ourselves to enter into relationship with others and learning how to share the uniqueness of who we are with the other and learning self uh, and listening to the other to find out what their needs are and, and so on. So the sixth house is a, is a real process of uh, detoxification of the ego. Um, and part of the importance of the sixth house is uh, part of the detoxification process, if you will, uh, is through service and, and actual work, everyday kind of work. Um, I used to, for about 15 years, I was a career uh, counselor at a public university. And so much of what I did was teaching these kids basic skills like of how to dress professionally, how to show up to work on time. Uh, and, and they, and I really got how they experienced it as a sacrifice of their whole lives up to that point. You get an 18 year old, a 19 year old, a 20, 21 year old, and suddenly they have to get up at six o'clock in the morning in order to get dressed and get to work on time. And uh, not only that, but dress decently, and not only that, but you know, act professional. And so we, we, you know, that's what in career counseling at a public university, you're constantly doing is teaching these kids these basic skills, and that's sixth house of how to prepare yourself to enter into the world. And part of the preparation process was really getting them to recognize that the only way that they're going to be acknowledged and uh, seen in the world is if they have experience. And so in helping them gain experience through um, volunteer work, nonprofit work, uh, internships, and so on. So connecting them with jobs um, that, you know, for, for kids who didn't have any experience where they could build their skills. And that is sixth house is building the skills that can be utilized in service to, to other people. Okay, and that does take uh, when you when you're coming through the first five houses, think the first 18 years of your life, uh, it does take adjustment, it takes analysis, it takes humility and purification. Um, and so, but there is a real sense of rounding uh, through, through offering oneself to work uh, in the world on a daily basis. 
and then the twelfth house. Then the other. Then so sixth house in relationship to the twelfth house. Okay, the twelfth house is the driving vision for. It's like, well, why do I do this? That was, I'd hear that a lot from the kids. Uh, so it was very important to, and it is important for everyone to have an internal uh, guiding vision uh, that inspires them forward, and especially or an ideal, but an internal to be in touch with their own internal vision that uh, helps to drive them forward towards self-actualization. Once that internal vision has been achieved, then, you, you, then, then you're completely, uh, then, then it's easy uh, to sacrifice for the sake of the vision because you know you're going somewhere. Now, of course, a lot of kids coming you know, out of high school into college, they have no clue who they are. Part of the way to find out who they are is through the practice, the practical practice of of, of work, um, and but also part of the job of career counselors at a university is to find out, to, to help them um, to, to, to access what their internal dreams are, what their internal goals and visions are that are uniquely theirs, not their parents. That was a whole nother thing. Um, so, uh, so that's part of it. it it's part of the uh, 12th house. Um, antidote, if you will, uh, to the sixth house, or I, I like to think of it as two sides of the same coin. It's important to have, uh, to be in touch with one's internal ideal to, um, uh, to inspire uh, one's work in the world, rather than, as Jeffrey Green often talks about, work feeling like a drudgery, uh, the Protestant view of work being, you know, being something you got to do because that's how you're going to get to heaven. And, um, that is the Protestant vision. And I think many of us sort of bought into that, uh, if not this lifetime in a previous lifetime. And so this is really about finding the internal vision that serves, um, that serves others, okay? That serves source. And one only way to do that is to connect with source, to recognize, and that's the humility that there is a larger power than our individual self, okay? And 12th house, after having moved through all of these houses in the uh, external world, it does rule the collective. Uh, so there is a necessary commitment to a larger whole, uh, to being of service to a larger whole. Okay. Okay, so Jeffrey Green in his article gives actual strategies for uh, six house self-improvement. And now we are going to be soon launching into um, the, our volunteer charts. But before I do that, I want to show uh, this slide here or just to kind of lay out what the strategy is. So uh, for the six house, the question is, what are the concrete practical strategies that you must implement through action, okay? So to find to do that, you find the sign on your sixth house cusp, and then you ask, what is the planetary ruler of that sign? And then you find, you go and find where that planet is located, what is that planet's sign, and what is that planet's house, and what are its aspects, okay? This gives, once you start following that, you get a ton of information that is very practical on how to help with the detoxification process and the evolutionary process uh, that helps to move into <clears throat> the seventh house where one can really be of service to the world. Uh, and then the question is uh, for the, the opposite side of the coin, what are the ideals that call you forward to, to your higher self-actualization? And it's very helpful to find the sign on the 12th house cusp. Ask yourself, what is the planetary ruler of that sign? Find where that planet is located and what is that planet's sign, what house is it in, and what are its aspects, okay? So there's a snapshot of uh, the strategy for self-improvement. Now, um, here is uh, Eve. <laughs> I am going to open up here. Oops, okay. There we go. So uh, sixth house. Uh, Eve, I'm going to, this is a little tricky. I want to be able to see Eve, but then I can't see my, I can't see my slide <laughs> if I see Eve. Okay, so, so here, um, that's what I'm, this is why I'm moving. There you are, Eve, hi. <laughs> this 
this is where, uh, yeah, wave, thank you. And you're unmuted, that's great. Okay, there's gonna be a few slides before you, I'm gonna let you talk, okay? <laughs> right. Um, so the question here is, uh, so the, again, just as a reminder, what needs self-improvement? Where is the current sense of lack felt? Again, this is sixth house energy, okay? What is the internal criticism coming from within that is if it is and manifests as external criticism and what are the strategies to improve? Okay, so we're gonna be talking about that. This is a chart. So just beginning here, uh, I want to, as you can see, I think I circled it, yep. There is, uh, Eve has cancer on the sixth house cusp. Okay, so this is the first step. She has cancer on the sixth house cusp. The moon rules cancer. If you see my, my arrow moving all over the chart, it's only because I'm moving the, the, um, the videos around so I can see the chart. Um, so there's cancer and there's the moon, uh, which as you can see is in Scorpio. But before I go into that direction, I just want to remind people what the moon rule, what the moon represents archetypally. Okay, it represents emotional security. Okay, that that is just absolute fundamental, and one's emotional experience on a moment to moment basis. Okay, so it, the moon rules our emotional body, and whatever our are on a really minute by minute, moment by moment basis, we're, we're constantly emotionally trying to find security in that moment, depending on what the um, experience is, okay? And there is a way in which there's our image is, uh, our self image is projected into that moment. So who we are as we know ourselves in that moment is projected outward. And we are trying to align our responses to, it being in alignment with our projection of who we are, okay? I know that sounds really complicated, but the, the main thing around it is the, the emotional security on a, a moment to moment basis, okay? Now, as you know, the moon uh, fluctuates, you know, the moon in the sky constantly fluctuates. It's, it's expanding and it's, it's decreasing, it's expanding and decreasing. Same thing with our emotions. So it, it's constantly changing. So we're constantly adjusting and, and attempting to find secure emotional security in the moment. Okay. So Eve uh, has her moon is in Scorpio. And then uh, we also, she has a planet in the sixth house, which we will be talking about, uh, her uh, Saturn in Cancer. But before we, I'm gonna to move to the next slide and I am going to let um, Eve speak to her moon in Scorpio in the 10th house up here at the very top of the house. 10th uh, house represents our public persona, how we're seen in the world. Um, but the, sorry, Eve, one more thing. <laughs> um, the, so uh, the moon in Scorpio is ruled by Pluto. Okay, she has Pluto and Libra. Both Eve and Annie, our next volunteer, are both Pluto and Libra generation. Um, and, and so the Pluto and Libra, and this, this works for both of them because Pluto, Pluto in evolutionary astrology, Pluto is like absolutely fundamental. So whenever as evolutionary astrologers, we interpret a chart, we start with Pluto. Okay, what, what Pluto um, generation are they is the big question. So the issue with Pluto and Libra generations, because you know Pluto's where our emotional vulnerability is. Uh, and so the question is with Pluto and Libra is in relationship, you know, feeling emotionally vulnerable in relationship with others. And feeling um, sort of, you know, kind of getting destabilized, um, partially because one's center is so focused on the other rather than oneself. So you feel in, so you're constantly in some ways compromising oneself for the sake of the other. Okay. And uh, for those who don't know, Pluto and Libra generation is a give or take a year, 1972 to 1984. Uh, so, okay. I think that's it. Eve, take it from here. Yeah. Thanks, Christina. So you great bet. to, yeah, just be present for that um, archetypal piece because it just talks to, and I've got my son in Virgo too. It's just Virgo is yeah. so, so yeah. powerful yep, yep, for me. Yep. But yeah, yeah, um, yeah relationships, uh, you know, this, this Scorpio moon, I just remember as a child 
having these emotions that would overwhelm overwhelm me um, and these deep waves of emotion that I really struggled um, to to deal with, especially in being in the world, um, intensely private person with Chiron down there on my IC as well. So um, the Scorpio moon is a, a thing that I love, but I feel like um, I'm still learning to ride the waves um, and it's such a big piece of who I am in the world um, that, yeah, it, it's a really, a really powerful thing. But yeah, relationships are such a big focus for me. I feel like they're, you know, they're my, um, I've had a lot of relationships, a lot of deep relationships, a lot of casual relationships, and it's an ongoing um, challenge for me to maintain my own emotional integrity, but meet another in their emotional fullness as well and then how they work together it's like I feel like I feel like a child just starting to learn this stuff mm -hmm. even though it's been my chart my whole life um mm -hmm. it's yeah it's a really powerful playground for me um so yeah I've had as you can see there I've had a pretty intense history and I'm actually going through a separation right as we speak mm -hmm. I'm looking for a new house right now and now I have a child as well and yeah, it's a real pain point for me, um, you know, because I am so emotionally sensitive and I really want to, with that Scorpio moon, I really want to be fully met by the world, you know, not just my intimate partner, but it, it plays into that. And so, you know, finding this, this place of wholeness, like you talked about with Virgo, of integration, where I feel so whole in myself that I can meet another and, you know, I still don't know how to quite do that. But yeah, it's um, been a big journey for me. Yeah, lifetime journey and in, in various various iterations. As soon as you feel like you've got a handle of it, you know, you're then something else comes along, and that that is the mutability of the sixth house, right? Mm. Um, I think so. Yeah. So I, I want to, and so much, of the, there's so much I could say right here, but I'm going to actually go to the next slide. Cause I want, I would like you to speak to your Saturn and cancer yeah. a little bit more. And I've got some information here on that. Uh, Cause that yeah. really adds to the story. Go ahead. Yeah. So Saturn in cancer. It's like when someone says, what's the least favorite part of the chart, I go straight there. I'm like, you know, mm -hmm. And, um, but I also know it's my life's work, right? And um, it's, a, it's a placement that I've, I've always found very heavy and burdensome in my life, you know? And, um, and I have this day-to-day, -day, you know, when you talk about the mechanisms of life, I have this great suffering of the day-to-day -day mechanics of just like this burden around the, the, the mundane aspects of my, my life, you know? Um, and, you know, with that North, I was just thinking about then the moon in Scorpio and with my North node, like I really get activated all the time about my vision and where I'm going in my, in my world and how I'm going to serve the world. And, you know, I feel like my day to day just gets in the way. Um, and it's like, I, I'm always craving that, you know, that more, that further, that expansion. And I guess with um, Mercury conjunct Pluto in the ninth house too, I get that, that expansion all the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm just finding, always finding I'm having to bring myself back to the daily practice of living moment to moment and particularly emotionally um mm -hmm. you know I've had um a lot of issues and I still do with emotional eating with really being able to regulate and be with my emotions um mm -hmm. a lot of tendencies mm -hmm. to want to check out and and that looking at my relationship with my mother which has been a big thing that's been coming up lately she um very uh supportive mother but no capacity emotionally um she's a typical archetype of victim martyr she's got a capricorn moon um so i grew mm -hmm. up with this mother who yeah. had no capacity to hold her own emotions and i just remember as a child having a no support for that at all and you know, she used to say to us when we had an emotion, you know, just just build a bridge and get over it. That was kind of that yeah. was kind of her thing. And that's what we learned as children. You know, don't feel it, just build a bridge and and step over it. So yeah, I could just feel the the truth of my imprint here and just that Saturnian um yeah restriction around my my emotional landscape. And just it was just very, yeah, it was very restrictive in growing up and I'm learning 
I'm now learning how to become my own authority, you know, my own mentor mm -hmm. around my emotions. Um, yeah. And it's, yeah, it's the Very biggest important. piece of my work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're bringing in. So whenever Pluto, Pluto is the ruler of the moon and Scorpio here. Uh, so it really brings in your karmic dynamic boom, right there, right? Mm -hmm. Not that we don't all have it, but you're you're emotionally bringing in this Pluto in Libra, uh, which brings in the south node of the moon in Taurus. So south, it's, you're getting the same, we're getting the same theme, you know, over and over. South node of the moon, this is the past life karma that you chose as a soul to bring into this present life. South node of the moon in Taurus is shut down. Okay, it's like, you know, to, the Torian, the phys physicality of shutdown in the fourth house of the emotional body. So that, that's a reinforcement of this, you know, Saturn and Cancer here. Um, but the Saturn and Cancer in sixth house is like, okay, well, yeah, you're, you, you know, for probably, you know, your survival instinct is to shut down your emotional body for very good reasons. I'm sure it was purely for survival in the past. But this lifetime, you're, you know, you're, you as a soul are strong enough uh, to handle, uh, to deal with very intense emotions. You know, you try to avoid the, the, you know, the intense inner reality, um, but that's not gonna happen with Moon and Scorpio. Uh, so it's in your face all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. And probably in other people's faces, being in the 10th house, very public. Uh, yeah. But then Saturn and Cancer, needless to say, it's like grow up you know, take responsibility for your emotional reality. And the only way to do so, sixth house, Virgo, is go inward and process, yeah. you know, become aware of them, you know, process them. Um, yeah, and then you mentioned also earlier, I wanna point out for those who don't know, um, Eve mentioned the Chiron in Aries, which is very significant um, too. Okay. It, it's right on the cusp of the third, fourth house. So Chiron is the wounded healer. So uh, it shows that there's a wound in Aries, which is, goes along with the Pluto and Libra. So like not, you know, the wound is uh, not trusting your own instinct, okay? Mm. Because of the emotional shutdown. It's like you've, you've lost touch of your own gravitas, your own center, uh, which is based in your, the, the instinctual reality of you. So in many ways, you're allowed to be self-centered, right? You, you've got to rediscover your desire nature uh, ruled by Mars, um, in, you know, Mars ruling Aries, but rediscover your, the instinctual body. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, but then it, it's retrograde pointing not only to Uranus, but pointing to the Libra um, up here. So you're for you to heal, you, you don't have the, the luxury of saying, I don't want to ever be in a relationship again, right? Yeah. That, that is precisely where your learning is, where mm -hmm. your um, teaching, where your growth is, is mm -hmm. finding yourself in relationship with others. To, and also the Uranus and Scorpio, Moon and Scorpio, and your, your evolutionary intention is to become familiar with um, the Scorpionic, you know, un, unconscious realm, the underworld, if you will, um, and, and find the beauty in it, find the jewels in the underworld. Mm. Um, Eve, didn't you mention that you were interested in magic and yeah. um, some of the, yeah, sort of the metaphysical realm? if you will, that Definitely is Scorpio. Metaphysical realm. Yeah, and I think there's my sun in the ninth, um, eighth house there yeah. as well. My Virgo yeah. feeds into that passion for the occult and the other world. Uh, yeah, so it's a big passion of mine, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the depths of it and the rich, you know, so it's like this, you came into this lifetime to find the riches mm. and um, and that will, you know, by, you know, sun in Virgo, so we're repeated the Virgo theme in the eighth mm. house, yeah, you know, you will shine the more your, your solar fire is going to shine, the more you feel comfortable in the um, metaphysical sort of the dark, the, you know, feel comfortable with the, uh, so in many ways, the unconscious of the, your personal psyche. Um, and, but then a house, share it with others. Scorpio, North Node, Moon and Scorpio. It's important that you sh share it with others. And Scorpio, trust others. Okay, that's, you know, take the, that's also Aries is, is taking the risk uh, and, and by taking the risk, 
risk in trusting others, you develop that courage that is centered in your instinct. And once you find your instinctual center and trust it in relationship with others, especially where you feel emotionally vulnerable, Scorpio, um, mm. I think you will you will find your um, you you will find your so your grounding, if you will, your your ultimate security. Yeah. Well, that's so that's so beautiful I can't wait to listen to that all back again but it's exactly mm-hmm. how I feel like part of me wants to run and hide from the world and relationship mm-hmm. but all of my yeah. chart points to my magic in relationship you know my Venus retrograde in the seventh house Leo like it's just mm-hmm. you know it's just um yeah it's just where my magic is and more and more I'm learning that partnership reflects my emotions back to me in such a powerful way that I can then you know six house Virgo work on them so much more powerfully than just being on my own you know Mm -hmm. um yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah. there's so much more but let's let's move to the I want to oops okay moving to you know the strategies for self-improvement the 12th house right um so what are the ideals that call you forward to higher self-actualization? Okay, mm. so we're gonna find the sign on your 12th house cusp. Oops, a daisy, let's go back. <laughs> find the sign on the 12th house cusp. What is the planetary ruler of that sign? And then find where that planet is located and what is its sign and house? So let's go there. Mm. So the uh, sign, interestingly, you know, that rules the 12th house is Capricorn. The planet that rules Capricorn is Saturn. So we get back into the sixth house again, Saturn and Cancer. So Saturn and Cancer is very, very important for your evolutionary trajectory, right? Mm. And also the ideals that can hold, you know, um, be in front of you to to guide you forward, okay? Mm. So, oh yeah, right. I forgot I had put this down. So um, go ahead, I'll let you read this. This is Uh, your story here. Yeah, totally. It's just about about the truth and that, you know, ultimately coming around to that 12th house and um, and yeah, I do. I, I try to, for me now, my practice, and I, it's the first time I've been excited about Saturn in the sixth house is like imagining life as this kind of treasure hunt, you know, with you, my deepest mm-hmm. truths and heart yearnings are so clearly now linked to my you know, my emotions that, mm-hmm. that occur in that, you know, that's what my whole life, but that's that sixth house cancer. And in particular, you know, the alchemy that occur, can occur with the heavy emotions. So really transforming this perception of heavy emotions being a bad thing into them actually being a pointer towards my deepest heart's yearning. So I've kind of, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm going through this big awakening at the moment about using my day-to-day emotional landscape you know, as my key evolutionary tool, like to dig deeper into that, which is my deepest truth. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've like, I've been getting this mentally and like downloads over the last, particularly the last couple of years, but now for me, it's the day-to-day practice of that, of really yeah. being able to be present, particularly with my challenging emotions and to kind of, um, you know, uh, dig into them in that kind of mercurial mercurial virgo way so that i can start Mm -hmm. to you know find the so what's the you know rather than getting caught up in the trigger of the deep emotion it's like what's the deeper yearning that is triggering that emotion like the positive within the you know the supposed Mm -hmm. negative so Mm -hmm. yeah it's like there you go and, and really for me moving through that you know that that the, the top half of my chart relating to others and using others in order to really accelerate that process. Cause the more you're with people, mm-hmm. right? Like, especially my partner, like he's my biggest trigger. Like I get triggers, yes. you know, every moment. And it's like, it's intense, but if, if I can see it as an opportunity for this, you know, um, I've got a, a vision of me like digging, you know, like, you know, um, digging kind of archaeologically you know to find Mm -hmm. the treasures you know so that's Mm -hmm. kind of my my journey ultimately um coming around to that 12th house and my truth yeah Mm -hmm. yeah so I'm going to just adding to here this is this exact same thing that you just read Uh, I just added a few things here to the the astrological part of it so I tried to imagine 12th house okay 
life now as a kind of treasure hunt, obviously moon and north node in Scorpio, right? Mm -hmm. uh, with my deepest truths and yearnings, Pluto, the soul, okay? Uh, laying buried beneath my heavy emotions, which is the Saturn and Cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the grav the gravitas of Saturn and Cancer, emotional gravitas. That's intense. By using my emotional landscape, and this is what I wanted to get here too, uh, is and reactions, Neptune and Sagittarius. So, um, you know, the astrological ruler of the twelfth house is Neptune. You've got you're part of the Neptune and Sagittarius subgeneration. So Sagittarius. Now, what you know, the striving for what is the truth? Um, mm. It's kind of like, uh, yeah, that's yeah, kind of the goal there. What is the truth? Always seeking, searching for the truth. Uh, and, and it being spiritually oriented, okay? Uh, as pointers towards that which I most deeply yearn for, that is where the magic is for me, mm. okay? So this Neptune and Sagittarius, and then of course you've got the Pluto Mercury in the ninth house, which is a Sagittarian. So we've got the, the mirroring of the Sagittarian archetype, this ninth house, Pluto, you know, finding a philosophy, a metaphysical mm. understanding of the universe that includes the underworld, you know, yeah. uh, that includes the intensity of the shadow and the depths of the shadow. It's very Jungian in many ways, mm. Um, mm. you know, yeah. We can never strive toward the light, light without knowing the shadow. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I get this mentally. I am just, just at the beginning of actually mm. living this inquiry each moment which is mm. absolutely the sixth house. Yeah. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. Anything else you would like to add, Eve? Um, no, just that uh, this is kind of where I'm starting to work in the world as well um, with, with my business and my service. I really love, you know, I love going to these places with other people, talking about sun in the eighth house, you know, starting mm. to, I'm really finding when I can hold space for others to do this as well, it, it even deep is deepening this journey even more. So, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm particularly yeah. funny, you mentioned, yeah, young and um, I'm definitely the whole shadow world and diving into that and working with other people is kind of really where I'm at as far as my service, you know, that Scorpio moon and starting to, you know, really mm -hmm. um, be in this world. My work up to date has been working in um, aged care. So working with people, you know, palliative care and working with people uh -huh. in that space. Perfect. Um, so, Absolutely. Yeah. 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 As a physio and as a healer and as a, you know, as a supporter. So uh, it kind of feels like this is the next, you know, iteration of that as I'm maturing and my soul is mm -hmm. emerging. It's just going mm -hmm. deeper, you know, deeper into that transformational process more metaphorically rather than actually, you know, in the real world, dealing with people in aged care facilities. Yeah, it's like, it's quite beautiful to watch how that's unfolded, yeah. That's beautiful, Eve. It's, it's really the, the plutonic realm, you know, the transition between this world and the next world. I mean, that really is the, um, that that is, you know, really getting an understanding of the plutonic, you know, cycles of death and rebirth and then the mm -hmm. decay, you know, so, so actually being able to be present for the decay, dying, yeah. death and the transition to the next world, which is a birthing to the next world. And that transition is very beautiful. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah. And then your eighth son in the eighth house, so that, that helps to fuel your solar fire being in mm. that, uh, you know, in, in the area of, because eighth house and sixth house are crises. So, yeah. you know, being in the, being comfortable in the place of crises um, yeah. is, you know, yeah emotionally and I would say that's that's definitely true for me I I actually find myself almost trying to create crisis in my life because I feel yeah. more comfortable when when things yeah. are in crisis yeah. and yeah. My, oh, yeah. my life is yeah so it's yeah like, yeah that's a good awareness to have yeah that is a really it's great the Saturn and Cancer and the six it's the awareness of so the immature so the, uh, way of operation, which pe where people just continuously create crises in their lives, crisis. because that mm -hmm. is it, it's bringing you know the past in. That's where they're comfortable. That's that's where yeah. they know that reality. Um, yeah, they, you know. So yeah, so taking responsibility for um, creating, uh, you know, and this is the higher functioning of Libra. You know, the peace, the pa the calm, the um, being centered. 
your own crises. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, we could go on and on. So, but well, we could. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. You're welcome, Eve. Thank you. So uh, let's see. Again, I just this this slide here before we move to Annie uh, is a reminder of the sixth house. Um, what needs self improvement? Where is the current sense of lack felt? What is the internal criticism coming from within that is projected outward and manifesting as external criticism? And what are the strategies to improve? So these are the questions to ask yourselves, all of us, uh, when we're trying to understand our sixth house um, processes. So for Annie, uh, welcome Annie, are you there? Hi, Christina. Hi, Annie. Thanks for being here. Thanks for volunteering. Pleasure. Uh, I, I am going to, let's see, there, Annie, with you, as, as, as I did with Eve as well, I, you know, I'm breaking down the, the sixth house into multiple slides based upon your response of what you know around the sixth house, right? So as you see, you know, part of what you responded, whoop, it's not on this slide, it's the next slide. It, there's a part of it, but then there's another part on the following slide, okay? So, because it, it, this helps me to point out in a more logical way, certain aspects of your chart. Because uh, you you have some very distinct places here, things going on. So, but to remind everybody, if you're not familiar with Mercury as the ruler of Gemini, because as you can see here, she has Gemini on the sixth house cusp. Okay, so this is the Yang side of Mercury. Okay, which which archetypally means you know it, it rules communication. Okay, this is you know the Yang side of Mercury, third house, Gemini. Rules communication, which could be anything from writing, uh, speaking, uh, just language itself. Uh, the Yang side of Mercury gathers information and disseminates it. It, it. it connects from one to the next, connects people together. People with strong Mercurial or Gemini charts, they are the, the connectors. They are the networkers. Uh, okay, Mercury rules the rational left side of the brain. Okay, versus the opposite, which is the Jupiter, which is the conceptual intuitive side of the brain. Uh, it rules the intellect. It can, merc mercurial folks can be very clever because they know how to work with uh, words. They can twist words around. They like to play with words. Um, and Mercury uh, is, is, is the ruler of the third house and the sixth house uh, in astrology is, is mercurial. I mean, it, it comes along with uh, how uh, the, everybody in the world understands Mercury, but it's also very mutable, you know, free flowing, changing and adapting, okay? So what needs improvement would be Annie's skills in communicating, connecting, processing information and analysis. However, she has her south node there, okay? So there's her Mercury in Libra, and which we'll talk more about in a bit. But I want to point out in the next slide or her south node here, uh, and I hope I've got, there it is. So her south node, as opposed to Eve, who had a planet, Saturn in Cancer in the sixth house, Annie has south node in Gemini in the sixth house. So that brings in the karmic dynamics. So as I mentioned before, Pluto and the South Node, did I? Yeah, I did, good. Pluto, which is up here also, yeah, up in the 10th house here, and the South Node are part of the past that she's bringing in in order to evolve, right, to improve. And then you put the South Node, especially the, in, into the sixth house, talk about really desiring as a soul to improve. Uh, and the Gemini, information, you know, her ability to communicate her, uh, the, the left brain analysis side of her mind. Um, but the, one thing I want to add here too, so Pluto and Libra, as I mentioned with Eve, it does rule, it, it does, the Pluto and Libra generation is issues around relationship with others. So it, it would be around communicating with others. Uh, her Venus, the ruler of it happens to be in Virgo. Right, so there, there's some processing, Virgo, sixth house kind of processing of the Venusian archetype of how she relates to others. Um, so, and then 
the, let's see, I wonder, I can't remember if I did this. Yeah, I did. So along with, okay, yeah. So her Mercury and Libra, we'll be talking much more about this in the next um, uh, slide here, Mercury conjunct Uranus in Libra. But right now we're gonna be focusing on Pluto in Libra with Venus as the ruler of Libra in Virgo. Um, as part of the karmic dynamic, as part of her past that she's bringing into the present. So, Annie, you have the floor. Thanks, Christina. Um, that. Um, oh, I don't really know where to start. Um, I guess as a way of explaining um, all of these things, uh, all the bullet points, I say that when I was young, um, I grew up in a pretty um, tense, um, household so um, and I found mm -hmm. it really difficult to navigate the emotions of other people so when I um, you know in order to fix that um, I would uh, try and make everybody else okay so I was always a bit of a people pleaser and just became really mm -hmm. good at um, figuring out what people need so if they could be okay then I could be okay as a means of avoiding tension or, you know, difficult emotions. Um, you know, if it wasn't harmonious or nice, I would um, just tend to um, really suppress it. And so if I um, came into contact with somebody who was emotional, um, I would try to make sure that they were okay because it just felt like their emotions would be calling to what I was trying to suppress and it was just too difficult to navigate. So that's why, yeah, I would be a, Oh, yeah, a people pleaser big time. And just to you know, give people what they need. And I was really good at tailing myself, like I think the Venus in Virgo, I'm not sure if it's it, but I could really tailor myself to what other people need so that they could be okay. Mm. Mm -hmm. But it would be at the expense of my own um, existence, really. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing with Gemini in Libra, God, you know, if you're honest, it, you know it's like you probably do it so fast you don't even have you know oh yeah like, it's second nature like yeah yeah, yeah. definitely yeah because the Mer mercury is quick to begin with in libra which is an air sign and then conjunct uranus is just phew, very fast um uh, it, 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 extremely quick responses i can imagine um yeah and then the venus and virgo yes do, does give a sense of I think part of what might be happening is this feeling of Virgo, I'm not good enough. There's something wrong sure. with me. All that stuff that I talked about earlier in the presentation. So to these mental script, especially uh, Mercury uh, rules Virgo, it rules Gemini. So there, I can imagine you get caught in these mental loops that oh, yeah, tend to sure. undermine you. Yeah. Or I even um, pre have conversations with people before, like Christina, you and I have had this conversation about a hundred times before we're having this mm -hmm. conversation. I find it very easy to be in the past and in the future, but I find the present um, quite difficult. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That makes, <laughs> okay. Well, just a little bit, if, if I'm going to kind of go off a little bit here, but you're honest, that is the, I was wondering the, Uranian, um, I do have an interpretation of Uranus conjunct Mercury, but Uranus in evolutionary astrology, Uranus rules our individual past as well as our individual future. You know, it, it rules the timeline. And then to have Mercury there, it's like, wow, I hadn't seen that, but it's like you could quickly either go to the past or quickly go to the future. So yeah, there is part of your detoxifying um, and self-improvement, let's say, is to be in the present, to stay in the present um, and finding balance, finding peace and harmony while in the present moment. That is, that's really key. Um, and then of course, it's in the 11th house of your uh, friendships in groups. Um, and as you say here, not interested in intimacy or partnership. You do have intense friendships. Yeah, that would be Mercury Uranus. And um, part of this too is, is your trajectory of finding who you, you know, the uniqueness, Uranus, of who you are. I, I believe you're coming in with the memory with Mercury Uranus ruling this, the, the South Node, the memory of, of a uniqueness that is incredibly somehow different. 
And this lifetime, part of the self-improvement is being okay with your differences, right? Yeah. And um, that is then also that goes along with the Venus and Virgo, you know, the, the constant self-improvement uh, in, in an introverted kind of way right at the top of your chart here. Um, yeah, as more, but do you have anything else you want to say about this or should we go to the next slide where I'm actually talking more about the Mercury Uranus or you talk more about the Mercury Uranus? Oh, the next slide's good. Okay. So the next slide really brings in uh, the Mercury Uranus in the 11th house with other people. So you go ahead. Um, oh, I've always, I had, growing up, my siblings were always um, high academic achievers um, and I was not, <laughs> so I always found it, I always felt really stupid or incapable of learning. And all of my learning was always, you know, very surface learning. It was just playing with words, but I didn't actually understand a lot of the content. So um, yeah, I would kind of just pretend to understand things that I really didn't understand at all. Um, yeah. yeah, I always felt like a disappointment and um, yeah, it was, I always found learning and expressing myself really difficult. If I could project what's in my, my mind into someone else's mind, um, you know, it would be much mm -hmm. better for me to not have to use words, but unfortunately, um, yeah, I can't project yeah. my images into someone else's mind yet. Right. Oh, I believe me, I understand that. Um, so the, you know, Gemini ruled by Mercury in the sixth house is the, is the practical concrete, the step by step by step. Uh, and you do with Mercury conjunct Uranus does indicate traumatic that there's there's mental trauma here uh, that that is showing up in the mind. So the inability to, you know, to understand the words. I mean, that that that's doesn't surprise me at all. Um, it, it, now, this could go, you know, if, if I was preparing for a reading with you, uh, you know, ahead of time and uh, I didn't know anything about you. It could go either way. It could mean so Mercury conjunct Uranus. Uranus means trauma. OK, and, and then you have it in the 11th house on top of it. So it, it, it could show a traumatic mind. But what happens in, with, in trauma is that we mentally fragment. OK, so part of our mind splits from the Virgo, you know, the, the, the physical, emotional nervous system. And it's kind of hanging out there. And when we're living a traumatic life, you know, let's say a previous life, the mind is developing on its own while the emotional body is not developing uh, or the yeah. emotional physical body is not developing, but the mind is, is not being, is. so at some point in your evolutionary story, you're gonna to have to integrate um, that fragment that is floating out there into the emotional, physical, uh, spiritual body as well. And that's what this is actually saying. And so you're based because I know your story. So I could have, you could have been like your siblings, you know, the scientist that's just mentally brilliant, totally consensus based. Everybody, you know, they get all the, they get all the awards, they get the credentials, they get the jobs, they get the, the recognition, right? Um, but, but your, your story is different. It's, it's the opposite of that. You're, you know, you're comparing yourself to your siblings who, who are playing that out. But I want to say to you that you as a soul are evolved, you know, you, you're evolving beyond the consensus state, right? Into, you're gone into the individuated state, right? Uh, and that is the, you're individuating your mind. And part of the process is integrating it into the physical the, the whole body system, which is not easy. Like you were saying, I mean, I know, like you were saying, it's like, you know, if you could transmit what's in your mind uh, to someone else, I bet in a past you could. I mean, that is part of the mental fragmentation is, is that there are incredible genius-like gifts that occur. Uh, you could have been do it, playing that out in the past, but this lifetime is like, no, you got to slow that mind down, <laughs> you know, and bring it into physical reality. And you've got to learn how to learn in a different way or how to communicate in a different way and in a way that's really unique to you, you know, brings, doesn't lose your uniqueness. Okay. Um, yeah, you gotta be careful with the South Node there too of, of comparing yourself to others constantly. You really are on your own <laughs> path here. 
uh, you've, you've got to individuate away and just recognize they're on their path, you're on yours. Right. Um, I think, anything else you wanna say about that, Annie? No. Let's see, I can't remember what's the next slide. Okay. Um, there was something else I wanted to also interestingly mention to the Chiron, the wounded healer, uh, Aries. He, that just is, is reinforced, uh, sort of uh, repeating what I already said. You know, the Chiron in Aries uh, is, is the importance of you reclaiming you, your instinct on an emotional level, same as um, Eve, right? And this, but this is pointing retrograde right back to the Uranus Mercury. So it's, you got to clean yourself as somebody who's different. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, 12th house question is, what are the ideals that call you forward to higher self-actualization? So again, find the sign on your 12th house cusp. What is the planetary ruler of that sign? Find where that planet is located. What is its sign and how? So we're going to go forward and do that. So there's the Uranus Mercury. Oh. No, I skipped. I, we, I, I knew we were skipping something and I really didn't want to. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now I remember. Sorry. So um, Mercury Uranus, I'm going to, uh, Annie, let you explain this. Mercury Uranus in the 11th house, and just for everybody, anyone who doesn't know, uh, 11th house is, uh, it's, it's our social group groups, it's our friends, it's our tribe. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I've always been super social. Um, friendships have been, you know, even at school, it wasn't, obviously, it wasn't about the learning. Um, it was, you know, all about the friendships and um, social engagement. So um, I've always had a really large group of friends, um, but they've always sort of been the socially disenfranchised groups of people. So um, I remember when it was illegal to be gay. So I was friends with in um, my first, my best friend came out to me in high school as um, being gay. And so um, I was just got more and more um, gay friends, but it was, I was the non-gay person in the group of um, gay friends. And then when it was funny with the timing of it, because when it became uh, gay marriage became legal, I just sort of lost all those friends. Yeah. They moved away or yeah. for whatever reason. And then um, I started ha having a lot of friends who are um, new immigrants. So, mm -hmm. but then I was also the outsider in that group because I was the non-immigrant in a group of people who are immigrants. So, yeah. Yeah. And I guess the Uranian, yeah. oh, sorry, what are you going to say, Christina? Well, I was just going to say, just to, I, I'll let you continue one second, but this is, as Jeffrey Green says, you know, the, the, the learning to the comfort of being a group of one. So surrounding yourself with people where you feel different from, from them, no matter how different the, those are that are surrounding you. I, I've always defined being um, on the outside. Um, I think our mother my brother wrote my mother's eulogy and even in that it was she really did teach all of us to be okay with being on the outside so I'm really comfortable mm -hmm. um having much in common with anyone is it's good because then you can learn about them I like you know it's interesting learning about different cultures and different points of view mm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that's great yeah I totally encourage you to you know find your tribe um, you know, continuously, or, you know, you're, you'll be driven to continuously find your tribe. Um, and that goes along with uh, the talking about uh, the strategies to improve, which would be um, looking at her North Node in Sagittarius, which is conjunct Neptune, opposite the South Node, obviously, it always is. Um, and Sagittarius, it's ruled by Jupiter. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Oh, I keep doing that. Ruled by Jupiter in Pisces. So your Jupiter in Pisces is squaring your nodal axis, right? Are you aware of that, Annie? Oh, I am. And okay. um, I used to, part of being a people pleaser is kind of telling people what they want to hear. So I would never feel like I'd be completely honest 
with someone. Mm-hmm. So in in crap little white lies that turned into yeah. whoppers. That's a Gemini. <laughs> it's that, like, it's because I didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Like if I felt yeah. uncomfortable, even family gatherings, I would, you know, just make up. And I mean, really, they just mm-hmm. <laughs> kind of escalated and got really outrageous just because I wanted to avoid anybody feeling bad about, you know, me not wanting to go. So, yeah. Now, truth and honesty yeah, is a big one, but yeah. yeah, I'm much, I'm really aware of it now. So I can really check myself before I. Mm-hmm. And that is the practice. That is the practice. It's hard because the mind is quick, especially yours. You've got a genius like mind, by the way. I mean, it's just very fast. It's just, you've got to learn how to manage it, how to work with it. Uh, and and be fine with it not being consensus a, a consensus based um, mind. Uh, and then Jupiter, when Jupiter is squared the nodal axis in evolutionary astrology, it is considered skipped steps. Okay, you've worked this in the past, the South Node. You've worked the North Node, and this lifetime is very much about integrating the two. Okay, you've done the, you know, the South Node, the Gemini thing, you know, twisting and turning the words depending on the situation in order to save yourself or to make yourself look good, Pluto and Libra uh, for other people, you know, completely losing your your center of who you are. Uh, And then the Sagittarius, conjunct Neptune, you know, full of, you know, stories that inspire others. You probably have an an amazing imagination um, that has been developed in the previous past. But this lifetime is about integrating the the left brain, Gemini, uh, uh, Mercury, uh, logical, uh, analytical side of your brain with the incredible imaginative, conceptual, um, you know, your visionary, what you're able to see in your mind's eye. Right? I was going to say Venus is a skip step as well. Oh, it is. Yeah, I hadn't picked up on that being um, it's it's kind of wide, but still, it's mm. definitely a part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Internalizing your values. Um, but before I go to that, the, the Jupiter and Pisces in the third house, this is repeating the, the Mercury Sagittarian theme uh, to have Jupiter, the ruler of Sagittarius in the mercurial house, right? In Pisces. So that this is very important. And then the, um, uh, resolution node is your North node in Sagittarius. Okay. So, um, it really is your, there is a focus on learning how to bring the imaginative creative mind and the internal vision that you hold into concrete reality, okay? You, you don't have the luxury of, of not paying attention to everyday reality. Uh, and you don't have the luxury of splitting the analytical mind from your, your imaginative mind. You're, you're being asked to integrate the two in your body. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, um, with the, are we talking about the sign on the 12th now, Christina, are we talking? I was talking about Jupiter in Pisces. Um, yeah. And there's a bit of a focus, like there's, there's a way in which you can flip black and back and forth, back and forth between the, you know, the Gemini's, um, chatty talking about superficial things kind of thing. Uh, and then adjusting your mind, depending upon the person in front of you. Uh, and oh, yeah. then also kind of disappearing into this mental, into sort of this imaginary reality. Um, so there's a bit of a focus. Um, you're really being asked to bring your vision into reality. In some ways, it's like you're you're holding a vision that is inspiring you, uh, the Neptune and Sagittarius. Um, it's kind of like bringing, you know, the heaven onto earth through your mind. Um, do you write at all? I do. Just that is, you know, that's I'm, a good way to bring it through the physical yeah, body. I'm kind of journal. I like to journal. <laughs> yeah, journal okay. cards. Um, you know, trips out in nature with a notebook. Um, yeah, that sort of thing mm-hmm. I like. But I have found that um, the more formal study of EA. So 
you know, yes. not to be a cliche, but after my Uranus opposition, pretty soon after that, I found evolutionary astrology and I just started hoovering. I've watched all of them, um, mm-hmm. but there was no foundation. So, um, you know, uh-huh. so it's all just, you know, pieces of information. Um, but the, yeah, the more formal study has been really helpful in integrating that for sure. That is good. I mean, it really is. It, it, for you, it's a both and. Um, for some other people, maybe not, but for you, yeah, really concretizing, you know, like the daily study of it uh, and the daily practice. I know when I was going through the certification program, we had to, you know, analyzing other people's charts and I have the same issue. I don't have the same thing going on here, but same issue. It's like, I can see things mentally and getting it into a linear form is extremely difficult for me. So um, the analysis, the analytical aspect where you're doing it one step at a time and following the formula is really helpful. I, yeah. I can't say it enough. And that yeah. is like on a daily basis, you know, or whatever we, you know, where you're consistently, you know, developing the habit of doing that. Uh, that is a good way because you're, you, you do have to integrate both of these. You don't have the luxury of just shifting to the North Node conjunct Neptune and Sag as much as you um, <laughs> may be you know, seduced by that. Uh, it always has to come back into the sixth house uh, South Node in Gemini. And the re- for those who don't know this, the reason why I'm saying that is because her Jupiter is um, it, it's squaring both nodes. So um, Annie has to integrate both of them. I mean, we all need to integrate our South Node and our North Node, but when you have North Node in the 12th house conjunct Neptune, if she didn't have Jupiter squaring it, there would be a huge focus on really developing the intuitive side uh, and, and, and her connection to subtle reality. But because Jupiter is squaring it, it it's really forcing the, the uh, integration into physical reality. So. I do find two reading charts, having the a person to connect with and give feedback is always, um, mm-hmm. you know, it can be a little bit too cerebral. So unless you have the person there to say, yeah, you know, yeah. to tell you more of their story, because I just found, found looking at the symbols, it doesn't really land mm-hmm. unless there's a person on the right. other end for me. For me. Sure, sure. Or, you know, find somebody who you're just, you just love, you know, a TV person personality or a political figure or a musician or something oh, think, somebody yeah. you just can't you know you you're dying to know their story that's another great way to do the this um while you're being inspired yeah. sure. and okay. it, it has oh go been, ahead sorry. oh sorry i was just gonna say no, it has no. been difficult but it is um the because i want to know everything at once so um the sixth house mm-hmm. really is important just to have the little Little, little steps, little gains is, yeah, mm-hmm. very helpful. Yep, yep. Oh, I, I hear you. I'm right with you on that. That's hard. It, it, yeah, <laughs> I feel like it's, uh, sometimes my brain hurts uh, when I'm doing the, the, the hard analysis um, part of it, but, uh, or trying to explain something to somebody that I can see in my head and then you gotta break it down into a linear way. It's just not easy. <laughs> So, um, okay, I think I'm going to leave it there. We've, yeah, we're in, in, into it an hour and a half. So I would like to open this up to questions. So if anybody has a question, go ahead and unmute yourself and speak up. It's pretty cool. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, while, while people are thinking about it, <laughs> mm-hmm. I just want to say, Christina, this has been awesome. I, I love the way that, oh, you. that you, you, with Virgo um, mm-hmm. precision, you know, explained everything and then, and then took it to examples. And, you know, it just is, uh, has been wonderful. Mm-hmm. Good, thank you, uh, Sue. I gotta say, um, I have North Node in the sixth house. So this there is my practice. This is, it's not easy. I, I, I'm with Annie on that. It's, it's the, you know, yeah, I just, I can't say it anymore. Um, yeah, it's not easy, but 
Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, job well done, I, I have to say. So does anybody have any questions? Robin, did you have a question? You almost look like you did. No, I was just thinking that was very, you know, very good presentation. I also have um, my South Node and Gemini in the sixth house. Oh, really? Uh, skip steps to Jupiter and the Sun. <laughs> so. Oh, wow! Uh, I was really Jeez. able to resonate with what you were saying, <laughs> with what I need to do. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Jupiter. So your Jupiter is um, as squaring your nodal axis. So the same exact same thing. Interesting. Yeah, you I have you actually have... the opposite. I have Jupiter at 10 degrees of Virgo. I have Mars uh -huh. at 21 degrees of Pisces. And then I also have my son in Virgo. So, so your son in Virgo, yeah. Yeah, and, and my Mars in Pisces, is, yeah. And my moon is in the sixth house as well in Gemini. Wow, okay. So that's my whole story. <laughs> it's almost like bringing together Annie and Eve in some ways here yeah. uh, with your moon in the right. sixth house with all that, you know, uh, Eve having the cancer in the sixth house. Uh, right. So too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, if nobody has any questions, um, you know, I guess we'll I'll just say good, goodbye and thank you, Annie and Eve again. I really appreciate all you, you know, your help here. Um, yeah, and thank you, volunteer. amazing. Christina. Yeah. And thank you, Christina. You're very welcome, it's my pleasure. Thank bye -bye, you. Bye guys. We'll see you next bye. time. Okay, bye-bye.